nothing without the humans who use them. In order to successfully integrate humans and machines together, we need to think about ensuring that the human users also understand the capabilities and limitations of these systems. So um, we're going to have the same kind of format as last time. We'll have two speakers give some very brief presentations to tee up these issues. And then we'll have a panel discussion with some Q&A. Um, our first presenter will be Dr. Jeff Kloon from the University of Wyoming. He's going to talk about some of the strange and counterintuitive properties of deep neural networks. And then Kimberly Jackson Ryan from Draper Labs will talk about trust in autonomous systems. So please welcome Dr. Kloon. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about what we call AI neuroscience, which is research into the question of how much do, do deep neural networks or artificial intelligence understand about the world they operate in. So deep neural networks, as we've heard all day today, are, or which also go by the name of deep learning, are amazing new type of AI that, whose capabilities have just skyrocketed in past years. They just do tremendously interesting, powerful things. For example, they can translate in real time, whether that be text or audio or images. They can turn the sounds that I'm making right now into the words that I'm saying, which previously has been very difficult. They drive our cars. They beat our world champion Go players. And they increasingly are being used in robots in the real world. Now, probably most importantly, deep neural nets have given computers for the first time in history the ability to truly see and understand the world. As you can see here, you can give these networks these pictures, and they can describe the contents of the pictures, the objects in them, and even give you a caption saying, girl in pink dress is jumping in the air, for example. But that raises the question of whether or not these neural networks that we're using and deploying really see and understand the world the same way that we do, which is important if we're going to interact with them. So in a nutshell, a deep neural net, which is a type of artificial intelligence, is uh, modeled loosely on the human brain. There are collections of neurons that you see here, and there are connections between neurons. And there are learning algorithms that, based on data, will tune every one of the connections that you see in this neural network here to try to perform some function, like taking this picture and calling it a lion. However, this neural net, which looks a little bit complicated, is actually puny according to modern standards. Most deep neural networks nowadays have millions of neurons and hundreds of millions of connections that have all been learned automatically by algorithms on data. And what that means is that these neural nets tend to be black boxes, which is to say that even though we wrote the code that causes these networks to operate and we have that code, we cannot figure out why they do and how they do the amazing things that they do. We simply don't understand how they work at anywhere near a detailed level. And that puts us in the position of neuroscientists, which is to say, here's this complex artifact that we have. It does remarkable things. And we have to, re uh, we have to reverse engineer how it works by inventing tools to try to figure out what's going on. So the way that we do that, my collaborators and I, is that we try to say, what is every neuron in a neural net do? What does it learn to fire in response to? And one way to do that is to take a neuron and try to figure out, for example, what is the image that maximally activates that neuron? So if it's a neural net that's learned to detect faces or lines or motorcycles, are there neurons in there that detect eyes and ears and mouths and noses? And the technique that we use is we have a computer artist that will generate an image, show it to the network, and the network will say, that's not really a lion. And the artist will change the image a little bit, and the network will say, yeah, a little bit more lion, but still pretty far. And the artist will continuously revise and optimize this image until eventually the network says, ha, now that is a lion. I'm absolutely certain of it. Now, you would expect that if you do that, then you would get images back that look like lions if that networks truly understand what a lion is. But in fact, when we launched this process and we looked at these results, and after we determined that it wasn't a bug, we were amazed. Because the network is absolutely certain that every one of these images here is a starfish, or a cheetah, or a school bus, an electric guitar, that those are without a doubt threes or fours. Which is to say that the deep neural net is easily fooled by these sorts of adversarial images. And we published a paper with that title. A related result by a different group found that if you take real images, such as the school bus and the temple on the left, and you make little tiny changes to them that you cannot tell the difference, then the network will go from being sure that that's a school bus to being sure that that is an ostrich, even though to you it still looks like a school bus. Now, this, re this attack has been brought out into the real world. So people took an off-the-shelf camera recognition, facial recognition system that was commercially available, put on glasses, put on these fooling patterns on the glasses, and the network thought that this man was that actress or this woman was that man. 
Now, you can imagine that there are serious, serious risks to deploying this technology out there in the world, even though we're already doing that, if these sorts of adversarial images and the ability to fool these networks exist, which they do. For example, any time that your adversary can make one thing look like another to your AI system, bad things can happen. If you have, it can, your adversary can make a hospital look like something that your systems want to attack as a target, they can make this bus stop here with, by buying an ad on that bus stop and embedding an adversarial image into it, make it look like open free road that a self-driving tank or car would happily drive right through, even though in fact it's full of human pedestrians. And there's an infinite number of these sorts of examples out there. So, does, you know, I also want to emphasize that these are trivial to produce. It doesn't, it takes only a rudimentary amount of machine learning knowledge to be able to produce these sorts of adversarial hacks on these deep neural networks. And one reason is because you do not need access to the target, to the network that you're trying to attack to produce these fooling images. Because I can f create images that fool my network into thinking it's a starfish or open road, and I can show them to your network, even though your network might have a different architecture and be trained on different data, and your network typically will be fooled in the exact same way. It's almost like all the, the artificial intelligences in the world are sitting around being like, why don't humans recognize that these are actually starfish? Silly humans. So it's profoundly deep and deeply interesting. Now, does the fact that these fooling images exist mean that the deep neural networks do not understand the things that they classify? That's one of the things we looked into. So we came up with two hypotheses. One is that the networks actually do understand the space of images that they classify, but the test is actually asking the wrong question. Now, we know from theory that machine learning systems are trying to do, when they're classifying, say, lions from dolphins, are trying to just make, tell the difference between things. So if lions are these yellow dots and dolphins are these blue dots, they put a line down the, between them and say everything above the line is a line and everything below the line is a dolphin. Now if you then challenge the system to say what is the most dolphin-like thing imaginable? What is the thing you're most sure is a dolphin? It's going to be something that's very far away from that decision boundary. And that might be an image that's way off in La La Land that's very bizarre and unusual looking, which might be why we got these bizarre images. Now that hypothesis comes with a prediction that if you could constrain our computer artists to only produce images that are nearby the space of natural images that look like real images, maybe we could recover the dolphin from the system. But there's another hypothesis, which is our, what our original hypothesis was that we put in the paper, which is that maybe the networks just don't ever learn the true global structure and don't deeply understand the things that they classify. For example, if you see this picture of a starfish here, you might say, oh, if I can see textured orange and a little bit of blue, call it a starfish. And I don't have to learn that starfish, for example, have five arms. Now that prediction, that hypothesis comes to the prediction that no matter how well I constrain my artist, I will never recover a five-legged starfish from this deep neural net because it never learned that fact about starfish to begin with. So we went about testing this hypothesis over the course of five papers over two to three years, and we used a lot of machine learning and a lot of math to figure out how to constrain the computer artists to only produce images that look like natural images. You're not allowed to go off and produce crazy fooling images. And what we found were these images here. Now, one column of these images are real images from the real world and our test training set. Another column are fake images produced by the combination of the computer artist and the deep neural net. Can you tell the difference for which is real and which is fake? And if you can't, what implications does that have for fake news and the ability for AI to generate arbitrary media that's indistinguishable from the real thing on demand? This is what the network thinks a volcano looks like. Note the detail on the diversity of what it understands about the space of what it means to be a volcano. And it can do this for a thousand different categories or more if we had more training data. So we really think these networks do understand the objects that they classify. So going back to the question, do deep neural networks, are they easily fooled or do they understand? Well, the answer is both. And the explanation is, imagine that this white box here is the space of all possible images, realistic and unnatural. Well, if in the colored region is where the natural images live, the probability density of real images. What deep neural nets do is they do something like for volcanoes, make this blue ellipse, which is to say everything in this blue area I'm going to call a volcano. And where that overlaps with real images, they do understand what a volcano is and they accurately classify it. But if you allow your artist or your adversary to produce images anywhere in the space, then you can get fooling images that are way out there, that either look like a school bus or look like static. So, 
I also want to point out that fooling images are not limited to just computer vision, to deep neural nets that look at images. Deep neural nets process sound and audio and all sorts of different modalities, and these fooling problems exist there, there too. For example, you could imagine if you have a voice uh, interface where you give commands to your self-driving tank or your phone, somebody could be playing background music in a cafe. When your car goes by, you could reprogram it, and you don't know that it's been reprogrammed because it's been woven into the music that's being played on a street corner. This is also true of malware classification networks, financial planning networks, robot cylinders with RL, generative models, you name it, all of these things have this problem. And it's also not specific to deep learning. It's a general problem with machine learning and it's, it's actually been known and shown to exist in other types of machine learning such as decision trees, support vector machines, if you're familiar with those forms of AI. So this is the general problem that we have to wrestle with. So in conclusion, I just want to point out that the neural nets that we've been talking about today as things that we should deploy and we ought to deploy are very easily fooled, even by novice machine learning researchers. They're easily hacked. That means that there are serious risks involved in using them that we have to be aware of, especially if you have an adversary. And that will complicate human interactions with them because they might give you very bizarre answers if you start asking them questions. But that doesn't mean that they don't understand anything. It means that you just have to coax that knowledge out of them carefully for example, as I've shown you here today. I'd also say that this fooling problem, which has been around now for a few years, has basically defied the best efforts and the brightest minds. So many, many researchers have tried to solve this problem, and it is not going away anytime soon, because we do not know how to solve this problem. So that means that we should continue to, re to research very heavily this technology in general, but also how to solve this problem of fooling and adversarial images. But also it means that we have to plan for a world in which we fail, because in in the near term, it looks like that's going to be the world we live in, which is to say that we will live in a world in which the most powerful, most capable artificial intelligence known to humankind is one that's also easily hacked and manipulated by our adversaries. And so we have to be aware of the best way to take advantage of that technology and mitigate its risks and downsides. Thank you. I'm Kim Ryan, I'm a human systems engineer at Draper Laboratory, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about issues surrounding uh, trust and artificial intelligence and trust in autonomous systems. So um, back in early 2016, a fatal accident occurred that was really the first of its kind, and a lot of you in this room are probably following the news about it either at the time or earlier this year when the safety investigation report was released. Um, a man was driving down a highway in his Tesla Model S. Um, he had the autopilot mode engaged, and the, um, the autopilot was in control of the vehicle. A truck drove across the lane that the man was driving in, and neither the autopilot nor the driver saw the truck in time. Um, and unfortunately, the, the car crashed and the driver was killed. So how does this happen? Um, looking at the, from a technical standpoint afterward, looking at the data, Tesla came out and said that the autopilot was unable to distinguish the bright white truck versus the bright sky. Uh, we have data showing that the operator didn't apply the brakes, so we can infer the operator didn't see the truck either for, for whatever reason. Um, but the interesting thing here is that Tesla came out and said this is a case where the operator shouldn't have been using the autopilot. Um, the instruction manual for the autopilot said it should only be used on divided highways with clear lane markings and entry and exit ramps, which wasn't the case here. Um, and furthermore, the um, recommendation for the autopilot is that the operator should keep their hands on the wheel at all times while the system is engaged. Um, we have data that shows that the operator ignored at least seven warnings to put his hands back on the wheel. So we have here a case where the operator placed too much trust in the system, um, was using the system in a case that it wasn't designed for, and the system failed. And this is something we're going to see more and more of as these systems are out in the world. The real world isn't a lab. Um, we can't control how users are going to apply um, autonomous systems. And we also have research showing that as the capabilities of the automation increase, there's a greater probability for mismatch between what the system can do and will do and what the user's expectations for that system are. And that mismatch in expectations is what can lead to a lack of trust. So I have a graph here characterizing the types of relationships that we see between a user's trust on the vertical axis and the capabilities of the automation on the bottom axis. So 
Um, we talk about wanting to have trust that's appropriate for a system or well calibrated for a system capabilities. And that's, that's right there on this diagonal line. We have trust um, that's, that's equivalent to the capability of the system or the trustworthiness of the system. Above this line, we get into situations of overtrust where, um, like the Tesla incident, an operator will rely on a system to do something that was outside the bounds of what it was designed to do. And below this line, we end up in situations of distrust, where an operator might take over when they shouldn't. Um, an example here is something like automated lane following or automated braking, um, each of which on their own has been shown to reduce accidents, but if a driver disables these features because he thinks he's better than the automation, you don't get those sorts of safety benefits. Um, so we want to have systems where operators uh, won't try to push the bounds of what they can do, but we also want um, users and drivers and operators to realize the benefits that we as system designers build into our capabilities. Um, so what I've been looking at recently is um, looking at how can we influence the level of trust an operator has in the system. And specifically, can we design systems that are better suited to facilitate appropriate levels of trust from an, op from an operator? And what we're finding is that there are ways to do this. So we've put together a set of heuristics or design principles that capture the type, types of information that impact an operator's trust of a system. Um, and we built this list uh, starting with looking at what was out in the academic literature. How do we currently understand trust? How is trust built and measured and understood uh, both between people, um, but also between people and robots or people in autonomous systems? So um, we took that data, we combined it with some first-hand data we collected with interviews from operators who were involved in operation and test of various unmanned vehicles, air vehicles, ground vehicles, underwater vehicles. And we came up with this list of seven design heuristics or, or design principles that we think capture this key set of information. And these are things like visibility of current system behavior. Does the operator understand what the system is doing right now? Visibility of probable system behavior. Does the operator understand what the system might do next? These get at things like situation awareness, which um, can impact performance. Um, things like awareness of latencies and delays. If I give my car a command, how long does it take to respond? This gets at predictability, which is also shown to be highly correlated with trust. Um, so we've used this set of principles in a couple different ways. We've started giving them to system designers. Um, they're worded in a way that's meant to be actionable as a way to influence system design very early in the process. And then we're also using these as um, evaluation criteria. So we can look at an existing system, provide a rating, um, and formative feedback to uh, guide how a system could be changed in order to better support operator trust before it gets put out into the world. Um, so the one I want to dig into a little more, um, and Jeff talked about some of these issues too, but uh, accessibility of system rationale. So this um, gets at things like, how is an algorithm or an autonomous system making a decision? What factors go into that decision? Um, what level of confidence does a system have in a decision? And these are really hard questions as you start to get into artificial intelligence and machine learning questions. Um, so as an example, um, I've pulled up a, an example of some of NVIDIA's work in driverless cars. Um, they use a, a deep learning based approach, which as Jeff pointed out, is very hard to understand. We don't know how these algorithms make decisions. The reasoning is not uh, well understood. Um, one of the things NVIDIA is working on doing is showing a user or a system developer um, what parts of the image it's focusing on. So in the example here, the areas highlighted in green are areas that the algorithm is focusing on. And in this case, it tends to correlate pretty well with the same types of areas a human driver might uh, be focusing on, but that might not always be true. Um, but you can see that after you observe the system for a while and you can see the types of data it's producing, um, you might start to understand a little bit more about what the system's good at seeing, what it's not good at seeing, um, what areas you might, as a driver, want to be ready to take over. Um, and, of course, this doesn't get at really hard human factors problems like distraction and fatigue and I, the fact that I want to watch a movie on my way to work. Um, but it does start to get at uh, calibrating trust appropriately. And this is a really active area of ongoing research. So someone earlier mentioned the DARPA Explainable AI or XAI program. Um, this is a program looking at how can we make machine algorithms more explainable. So um, in this example, we have an image of a cat. Um, there are lots of available toolkits that um, can tell me that this image is a cat, but what's much harder to do 
is tell me what parts of this image are cat-like. How was that decision made? What other choices did the algorithm come up with? Um, and this starts to get even more interesting when wrong answers happen. So some of you may remember when Watson was on Jeopardy several years back, um, answered Toronto. Everybody wondered where that answer had come from. Um, and if you start to understand what features led to that decision, it helps you not only understand the capabilities and limitations of the algorithm, uh, but also what steps you might take to make that algorithm better. Um, so to wrap up, uh, trust in the system must be appropriately calibrated for the system capabilities, and this is something we can influence through the design of systems. Um, and while high performance is critical, it's not sufficient on its own. An operator needs to understand the decision-making rationale going on uh, behind the algorithms. We need artificial intelligence that's high performing, uh, but also transparent and predictable as we move forward. Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Dan Lamoth. I'm with the Washington Post. Uh, I cover the military and the Pentagon. Uh, I'm also a former fellow with the uh, Center for New American Security. Um, I'd like to introduce our uh, two other panelists here. Uh, you've already heard from uh, our first two. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, Dr. John Hawley. Uh, he's an engineering psychologist with the U.S. Uh, Army's Research Laboratory at Fort Bliss. And we also have Dr. Caitlin, Caitlin Surik Bakharn. Uh, she's a research scientist with uh, Purdue University's Policy Research Institute. Uh, we heard a lot at the top here um, about the trust issues and about potential problems. Uh, and while there's a lot of exciting possibilities uh, within this space, uh, those are certainly concerns that are going to come up. Um, Dr. Holly, uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what you heard so far. Trust and automation is a an interesting issue. Uh, I've spent a lot of my career early and then with a gap going off to do some other interesting things for the Army like the ill-fated future combat systems and then came back to Patriot after the fratricides during OIF to lead a human factors oriented evaluation at the direction of the CG down there to find out, well, we understand how this happened from a technical perspective, from a, an engineering perspective. Now, how did human factors contribute to this incident? The Army had started out when they first began using the Patriot system in fully automatic mode with the mandate to the crews that they were to trust the system without question. In other words, they took the issue of trust and automation off the table, which probably was all right at that time because they didn't train those people well enough to be able to understand how the system did what it did. After OIF, we saw a, or I've seen a shift in the other direction where Crews now mostly distrust the automation, rightfully or wrongly, and as a result of that, they try to impose themselves more into the, the loop, the decision-making loop, the command and control loop, as opposed to using the system more appropriately in an on-the-loop or a supervisory control mode. So in, in some sense, they learned the, some of the wrong lessons out of OIF, which is not to trust the system because it won't make the right decisions, and if it doesn't, you'll, bad things will happen, and uh, we'll get into trouble. Caitlin? So I was really excited to hear Jeff say that we're going to live in a, a society where our automation fails. <laughs> People don't talk about that enough. Um, so I do human function allocation, which means basically what are we going to have humans do in all of these automated systems. Um, and we've been talking about the race for AI, the race for automated systems, and and I think as a country and as a, as a group of researchers, we need to focus on not being first to have this technology, but the first ones to get it right. And I think figuring out what humans are going to do in these systems is how we're going to get it right. And it's going to be how we set ourselves apart as a nation. Um, systems will fail. They will. Um, they're computer programs. They will fail. They will pick the wrong image. Um, there will be bugs in the programs. And when they do fail, how are we going to take over? How are humans going to take over these, these highly complex automated systems? And there's a huge range of types of systems that we can talk about. Um, we can talk about like fighter jets, where it's definitely too complex for a human to take over. So if it fails, you eject. Um, and then you can talk about driving, where we all can drive. 
Um, and if we have an automated system and that fails, at what point can we take over? Where, at what level of that kind of automation are we capable of taking over? Um, and what function do we have to be doing while the automation's running for us to be able to safely take over when the automation fails? Okay. A uh, question really for any of you, uh, particularly when we look at this through a national security perspective. Uh, we look at this as through the perspective of how this might be injected into our military. Um, there will be certainly concern, uh, troops as they are attempting to use this. Some of them are going to be excited about it. Some of them are not going to want to touch it. Uh, what would you say to them uh, as you're, I guess, pitching these sorts of uh, potential solutions uh, and, and also dealing with the, the pitfalls and the risks and all of that? And that's open to any of you. That's become a, an interest of mine, is how you properly prepare an organization to use this kind of technology. I think that one of the lessons that I observed in Patriot, and I'm not con condemning the Army, it's just that the Army got there first. Patriot has been, the engagement process could be fully autonomous, and it has been for more than 30 years. But when you put that type of technology into an organization that has ideas about how such systems are to be used, that can create problems. You have got to, in a sense, transform that organization to deal with that technology. And I find that in the, in the military, and again, my experiences have only been with the Army, that is very difficult to do. You've got to go out and you've got to change a lot of the, there are a lot of legal, regulatory, and just cultural practice constraints that get in the way of doing that. You also have to re-educate commanders at various levels for how this stuff is to be used. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work in Network Enabled Mission Command over the last couple of years, and it shows up even there where there isn't a lot of control automation, but there's a lot of information automation. And the this, this, this stuff doesn't show particularly well in a lot of operational tests, even to the point where systems that like Win-T that perhaps aren't the best, but get a bad reputation simply because these units don't know how to use this stuff. They don't know how to use it. They don't know how to maintain it properly. So there is a, trans a transformation process that has to go on. There are lots of new skills, particularly on the sport, on the, uh, in the area of how you command an organization that has this technology that I think we've only begun to scratch the surface on. It changes what they do and how they do it. Any other thoughts on, along those lines? I would just say that in my experience, humans are pretty good at figuring out how well things work. Uh, and so if they can use the system a lot and realize that it's working quite well, then they begin to trust it. In the case that you gave, it's rather remarkable. Somebody decided to ignore seven warnings and trust the car enough to drive down the road. And potentially there's rumors that the person might have been watching a movie, et cetera. We don't know this for sure. But the point is, is that somebody experimented enough with that system, I'm sure the first time they engaged it, they were sitting there like that. And then over time, they basically could come to say, this is working. And so I actually think that these technologies will sell themselves if they're reliable enough that the more that you use them, eventually you just start saying, okay, this is either better than me or it's good enough and I'm going to you know, use it. So the, the real thing is, maybe convincing people to use systems that you don't actually get to experiment with a lot, that might be a different sort of human factor issue. But for the stuff that you get to do, like self-driving, you know, talking to your phone and having it transcribe into text and whatnot, the better they get, eventually people will just switch over if they're better than themselves or the humans. I do think it's worth, though, to, to think about that high reliability factor. And I think that that also injects a level of complacency among people. And when that does happen, like the driver of Tesla, so they were the first ones to have autopilot, and they were also the first ones to kill somebody because they were complacent. Uh, the, the driver became complacent. It worked however many times, and then it didn't work. And I think that level of complacency can be very dangerous, especially in a national security sense where you trust that, you know, even doing, um, like, image recognition. So you trust that the computer has caught this every single time. So you stop paying attention, and then the time that it misses it, the, the time that it, it throws you a warning that something seems off, and you disregard it, and it could be absolutely catastrophic from, from an infrastructure perspective, from a security perspective, or from a lives lost perspective. And I think that level of complacency, and how do we address that, I think that's, um, we don't know how to address that yet, but I think that's something that's really, really key in this discussion. I think it's also really important to make sure that part of the the training or the organizational familiarity with this technology involves an understanding of the capabilities of the uh, system. So as an example, 
Um, I have a friend who just moved to Boston from Florida last year. Spent his whole life in Florida, you know, been alive for 30 years, so he's been driving for 15 years, and he's an excellent driver. Um, first time it snowed in Boston last year <laughs> was a challenge. Um, so that's an example where it's, it's pretty obvious from a human standpoint, you know, something is different here. But if you don't know all of the factors that go into the capabilities, it may not be as obvious when something has changed that requires additional capability. One additional spin on that that I think one of the gentlemen that was sitting in this chair in the previous panel brought up is that when you get into some of these situations like you're describing, expecting an operator to recognize that something has gone amiss with the system and intervene appropriately is, is probably an unrealistic expectation. And in that case, you're probably, I, my guess would be, I, I have some data on this, but not a lot, that, in, in a, again, in the case of air and missile defense, perhaps a lot of aspects of tactical control of those types of systems are best left to automated systems with the human's position in the command and control complex being relegated to a more high-level or strategic position, setting the parameters within which the system operates. The uh, mistakes will still be made. But at least those mistakes will be repeatable. You can understand why it was made after the fact, when you, why when you're dealing with humans who will then intervene in that process, perhaps inappropriately, you'll never understand why, exact, why it happened that way. Okay. Uh, thinking through some of this from the opposite side, um, Caitlin, you mentioned that we may not want to be first here. We want to make sure we get it right. Uh, I imagine looking at this, especially when you look back through history at things like Sputnik, where we were not first, there's a freak out you know, from the U.S. side over, okay, now we need to catch up. Uh, and culturally, uh, both with, with our senior leaders and, and also, you know, rank and file service members who again would be dealing with this, um, what, what do you think should be said should something like that arise? Should we not be first? I think that, and this is hard because this comes from our, our American culture of American exceptionalism that we should be first and we should be best. Um, but I think actually we should focus on being best uh, more than first. Um, I think, and I, I, we've seen this with um, you know, some technologies and I think we'll see it potentially with autonomous vehicles. Um, the people that are first will fail and I think they'll fail in a very big way, unfortunately. Um, and I think the people that come around in maybe the third or fourth round of these types of technologies will be the ones that get it right. And we, you don't want to be the company that fails, or we don't want to be the country that fails, or we don't want to be the country that unethically kills millions of people because we haven't figured out all of the bugs of our technology. Um, I think from an optics perspective, we'd much rather be not on that end of, of policy making or of the news cycle. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty strong argument. Um, you don't want to be responsible for the, the robot drone that's outrageously killing large numbers of people because we haven't figured out what's making it make the wrong decision. I just want to maybe point out that we should potentially differentiate between being first at deployment versus being first at research. So I fully agree that we may not have any need to be the first to deploy a system. Yeah. But we absolutely want to be out in front, way out in front if possible, on the research side or the knowledge side. So anything that you know, we're not confident in, we better at least have that on uh, testing sites. Because as somebody mentioned earlier today, this is kind of like Hogwarts. There's new magical, mind-blowing results coming out by the week and by the month. If you've ever heard of the term technological surprise, AI is going to deliver it in spades because the technology is amazingly powerful. It's advancing at a rapid clip. And we cannot predict what capabilities it might have in just a few years, let alone sometimes months. And so we absolutely do not want to be so safe and so secure that we are not right at the cutting edge in terms of knowing exactly what's going on because we don't want to be caught by surprise and trying to play catch up in a game in which sudden AI capabilities, we heard from the, the previous DARPA program officer, might allow you to seize the power grid of Manhattan, for example, or to you know, take, take control of every robot or car in an entire country in a heartbeat. So uh, perhaps first in deployment is not necessary, but definitely first in research. I think we absolutely should be all in on investing and researching AI, military and companies. Totally agree. When we look at uh, where our autonomous systems are now, um, things we've seen, uh, the Strategic Capabilities Office and some of the work they've done, PERDIX, you know, all, some of those smaller things that have surfaced. Um, 
what do you think is missing from this conversation of, of trust, of, of being first, of being right, all those sorts of things? What do we think is missing? A, a term that I use a lot when I'm discussing these things with higher ranking officers and particularly with the Department of Defense's acquisition pe people is that when this technology enters military organizations, it becomes part of a complex socio-technical system. And most of the time, the emphasis, I would say 90% or even higher of the emphasis during development of this is purely on the technical side of the hardware. Uh, very little consideration of how the humans relate to that, very little consideration of what proper training for the use of such systems, education and training for the use of such technologies has to look like, and how you have to change the organization to make better use of this technology. Almost no consideration of that. What the uh, military calls all the .LP, Doctrine, Organization, Training, Leader Development, and Personnel considerations are given almost hand-waving associated with it. I mean, that's been one of my major gripes for years and years and years. You go back and look at it and say, these are complex socio-technical systems. You can't treat them as if we are evaluating simply hardware solutions. When you put people into them, they become something else. DOD has to learn that lesson. So to build on that, um, I agree that so much of the technology is the focus, um, the programming, the types of technologies we're designing. Um, but there's not a lot of talk of what are the humans going to do. Um, supervisory control works in some cases, but um, it has been proven to not be effective for quite a few cases. Um, so what are they going to do in turn? Um, we don't know, and not very many people are talking about it. And I think it's a big component of how we're going to actually be able to implement this kind of technology. And to build on that, I think it's really important to think about how, how people will interact with the system. So as a user interface designer, I've walked into a lot of projects where someone says, well, it just needs to work, just put a user interface on it. Um, and by then, it's, it's much too late. Um, these are issues you need to solve early on in the design process so that you have the right you know, ICDs for the technical folks or the right hooks into the system to get information to a user at the right level. So these are issues we, we should start thinking about now. Uh, think, thinking this through again from the, the humans and machines perspective here, uh, we, we've reached a point where the military is not always driving development, not always driving innovation, um, and, th and there I imagine will be skepticism or suspicion at times that uh, industry is too far in front and, and pitching its ideas, and especially from the end user point of view, uh, that maybe these things aren't ready. Um, Sort of from the psychology side of things, from the leadership side of things, how do you, I guess, suss that out? Why, why, do, why has DOD lagged? I can give you my impressions as to why that is. It, it has to do with the defense acquisition process and all the, the regulations that go with that. Um, it isn't uh, what uh, the guy from Google said earlier with that name, Schmidt. He said, is that yes, uh, they don't lead anymore. They, Probably, my observation is they don't hire the kinds of people that the Googles and Apples and Microsofts of the world can, can hire or do hire. It, isn't, it hasn't tended to be an exciting place to work. It, um, requirements are written uh, without really understanding very well what you're asking for. Uh, defense contractors go out and they're really almost punished are not rewarded for being innovative. It's much, much safer in the, uh, in the defense acquisition arena to take a, a, a less innovative approach that, and then work on it. Uh, as I sometimes have observed somewhat laughingly is that the inefficiency in defense acquisition is profitable. And so they're not, uh, risk taking is punished both on the side for contractors, it's, it's hazardous. Uh, it's hazardous for program offices who get graded primarily in the interest of time and budget. And uh, so they'll take the safe way out and build systems that uh, don't advance the state of the art very much, which then again, uh, they become, that wraps around the back on itself and it says you don't get the best and the brightest to want to work on the, on the systems for the Northrop Grumman's and those people of the world because that's not where the action is. It's with Google and it's with Microsoft and companies that do that kind of work. I think it's cultural risk perception. Um, I think out in Silicon Valley, the companies, the people that own, own it, the managers, people that are hiring, they're willing to take risks on innovators. Um, people are willing to accept innovation. They're willing to try new things. Um, they're excited by it. 
And I think the culture, particularly within military, is definitely to minimize risk. Um, and to take some of these new technologies, like AI or autonomous systems, definitely requires a risk-seeking culture. Um, and I think until we change that kind of risk perception culture, you're going to have a hard time. Um, and there's definitely also underlying politics, of course, that go with that kind of stuff. But um, I think risk perception and kind of the culture that you that, that space lives in uh, plays a big role in how we accept um, and how quickly we accept um, new technologies like that. This isn't new either. If you go back and you look at the history of aviation, uh, some of the people like Billy Mitchell and others who advocated changes in concepts and changes in practices and building different kinds of systems were actually got into serious trouble. Mm -hmm. They were not rewarded for that. And then you can take a look at the development of interesting concepts using technology during the interwar period. For example, the development of Blitzkrieg Doctrine, which all of that stuff was there and everybody had it. The Germans just developed it more fully because they were willing to take risks, be experimental, and they had lost the last war. And they did a deep inquiry into why they had done that, which the British and the French didn't. And of course, we weren't even in the game at that time. So uh, yes, it's partly cultural. And I don't know how you bridge that cultural gap. The military has a tendency to be innately conservative. It's going to be a tough nut to crack. So a good example of this is with air traffic control. Um, it's unbelievably difficult to get new technologies um, put into play in American air traffic control. The FAA has an extremely lengthy process to do that. Um, but if you go to other countries where they have, um, um, what do you call it, that they're um, privatized, I'm sorry, they have privatized air traffic control, they are light years ahead of us. Um, I've been in these facilities in other countries, they are light years ahead of us as far as technology and capability um, because they're not constrained by this um, very risk averse culture of the government. And I think that plays a big role. You, uh, if you take risks in a defense acquisition project, and, you're, and you bring a system, usually they, in order to sell it, you have to make very optimistic assumptions about its performance and its costs and its timelines and things like that. And eventually they will, and I'm working with a system now where the, they have done just that, and they brought it out for test well before its time. This one was given a reprieve of four years, but the usual case is to say, oh, this system is no good. Uh, therefore, we cut your budget and possibly even cancel it. And so the people who manage the systems are well aware of this. <laughs> and that has a tendency to make them risk averse and also to make them less than forthcoming during operational tests about what these system capabilities really are. It's a, it's a perverse environment that of, of their own creation. It's easy to understand it from the outside, but it's very, very difficult if you're on the inside to change it. It's just almost unchangeable. I don't know what it would take. Um, th I imagine it probably is a matter of time, just based on the nature of ac acquisition, the nature of development, and, and the dangerous missions that sometimes intertwine with this, this space. Um, something bad will happen that will be on the page one of the Washington Post and every other newspaper in the country that covers this. Um, there will be a tendency on Capitol Hill, there will be a tendency in the media to scrutinize all of that. Uh, and it will, be, it will be necessary. But at the same time, there will be a likelihood to probably recoil afterwards. How do you put, I, just, I guess, push and press to continue the development when you're going to face a lot of pressure at that point? That's a hard question to answer, too, because we, again, in the case of Patriot, you can see it. After the uh, second fratricide in OIF, the Air Force, which has operational control of Army, a big missile air defense, shut it down. And they, they could only shoot at targets or tracks that had been specifically authorized by the Air Force op center that they could shoot. The, that effectively took Patriot out of the system at that, or out of the war at that point in time. Luckily, they didn't have anything left to shoot at or nothing happened. But that is an example of the kinds of pushback reaction you're likely to get. And if more damage had been done, I can definitely see that uh, the people in this building right over there might get in the act and pass a bunch of laws that would seriously get in the way of uh, advancing this technology rather than realizing that, yes, it makes mistakes. And it's got to be expected. I mean, we didn't develop commercial aviation or even military aviation in the state it is right now without having to experience a lot of crashes. A lot of planes crashed. And in, the, in this current environment, I sometimes wonder whether as risk averse as we have become in these areas, 
what, if we were, had been that risk averse back then, where we would be with respect to even that simpler technology. To develop it takes a lot of risk and it's not always going to work properly. A lot of people will die. I'd like uh, each of you to present an idea, uh, just a minute or two, of something that, that excites you in this space that doesn't always get attention. A any idea that comes to mind? I'll start the ball rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to take an excursion after working with the air and missile defense people for a while. I think they had enough of me and I had enough of them. And so I went off to work with the maneuver force, infantry and armor types, looking at uh, network enabled mission command. And it, I started thinking about command and control for these types of highly automated systems in a very different way after I had that experience, with a newer experience with the maneuver forces. They have this concept of mission command, which is basically mission orders sort of adapted or copied from the Germans and, and applied in our own way. And I think that that sort of philosophy applies if you're dealing with increasingly intelligent systems somewhere in your network, that the idea that you're going to have in the loop control over those kinds of systems operating in very complex environments, doing very complex things in very short time periods is probably being unrealistic. We'll have to get to the point where our view of these things in terms of what humans in, humans in the loop really means or human oversight, it's more of that strategic is I'm going to allow you to operate almost like a subordinate military unit would operate. I realize you'll not always do things properly. I'm going to set the parameters within you, which you operate. But I think we need to understand better how you properly prepare people at various levels in these command echelons to operate that way. It, it takes a change in, in, in the philosophy or a change in their orientation toward what it means to command an organization that has a lot of this technology in it. Operating within the intent of the commander, even if sometimes that in operating in the, is being done by an artificial entity. Any other thoughts? I would like to see where the tipping point is of where humans have the ability to um, perform takeover in an automated system and at what level of automation do we lose that ability. Um, so looking at systems from a, um, you're in a positive state where nothing is happening or the system's operating appropriately and then you have a non-positive state where it's failing. And what are the functions of that such a system that would move you to that um, non-optimal state? And if we were to manipulate them and automate these different functions, at what level do humans lose the ability to um, have safe takeover? That's what really excites me about the automated field right now. I'm really interested in understanding how uh, autonomous systems and people can learn and train together. So we talked a lot earlier about how a lot of machine learning systems get trained and then get sent out into the field and that's their end state. Um, there are a lot of people looking at how you can have systems keep learning and I think there could be some really powerful ways to build, build trust in systems and build appropriate trust in systems if you can train with your robot like you would another teammate um, and, and sort of structure the, the learning in both directions. So I want to um, think a, bit, a little bit on uh, the longer term view. We spent a lot of time today talking about how humans should be in the, in the loop and that AI should be explainable to humans. But both of those goals basically assume that humans are better than AI. We've had a little bit of pushback on that idea, but in the near term, that's certainly going to be true. But in the long term, I just want to entertain the possibility that it might be hubristic to think that we're smarter and better than what AI will soon be. Because the rate of AI is progressing extremely rapidly, and we have no idea where AI is going to take us in the near future. So um, Ilya Seskever, who's one of the founders of OpenAI, where Jack works, um, mentioned to me the other day something that I think is actually a possibility that we need to consider, which is that AI may gain very powerful capabilities. We don't know whether or not that's a few years or decades, but it's likely to happen. And we need to think about a world in which that happens. Maybe our puny human brains aren't ready to understand the explanation for why a decision was made, because we are limited in our cognitive capacities in a way that AI may not be. And we may have to get used to a world in which a lot of decisions are made for us that we can't figure out or understand, and which we're not better 
when we're in the loop. And I know that I pointed out a lot of limitations on AI, but I also simultaneously am a big believer, if you look at the curves of advance, that this might take off and be uh, rather interesting and maybe possess superhuman capabilities in the near future. We want to think about that. And Ilya talks about the fact that, you know, he thinks there's a probability of 100% that eventually some rogue agent, whether or not it's a lone wolf or a foreign government, will try to create AI that self-replicates and tries to take control of the world and maybe gets beyond the control of that lone agent or government. And we need to be able to potentially combat that. I know this is the movie and the nightmare scenario that a lot of people like to dismiss, but I'm actually with Ilya and Elon Musk that this is a concern, even if it's only a 1% concern or less, that we need to think about because there are serious consequences if that happens. So Ilya calls that a cancer, and he is working on an AI immune system, which is a system by governments, by companies, that are, and by nonprofits such as OpenAI, that are trying to look and detect when cancer emerges, when might some very, very powerful AI advance be out there, and detect it, and then maybe try to contain it. Now, of course, that's AI fighting AI. What could possibly go wrong? Um, but I just want to say that I don't think this is beyond the realm of science fiction or only in the realm of science fiction that, you know, it's myopic to think that it's going to be a steady linear increase. It's probably going to be exponential increase in capability, and there's a lot of people in this room who probably should think about a world in which foreign governments or our own have tremendously powerful AI that we can't fully con control or understand. I'd like to open it to questions. Uh, there should be microphones <laughs> going around. Okay. Uh, I'd ask that uh, your uh, question ends with a question mark, and... Uh, <laughs> That you uh, just wait for the microphones. This is uh, Tim Marler from RAND Corporation. Um, when you're talking about neural networks, and perhaps this applies to AI uh, in general, but fundamentally it's a, a model, um, and you, you find some parameters to kind of fit that hypersurface of sorts to a set of training data. Uh, and if it's overfit or underfit, you have error. <coughs> um, and that causes some problems, as we've been talking about. But there seems to be precedence for this. Let's say uh, finite element analysis or structural engineering code, which might have error when it predicts uh, when a crash or a set of loads crushes a car. And you can go back as far to where you have a curve fit to three points. There's some error. But we've developed trust for those things, perhaps through VNV, through validation. But now we're having this discussion today about another model. Is there some precedence for this? And why is this special? Are there lessons learned? Not to suggest this is as simple as a curve fit through points, but if you look back, um, how is this different from other very complicated models? And is there, are there some lessons learned for uh, instilling trust or developing trust? Any thoughts? In some sense, it's the same, and in some sense, it's a little bit different. I think it's the scale, the level of complexity, and the capabilities of the system. So these problems have always been there. They're not new. Um, but when you look at a curve, you can kind of envision very easily in a human intuitive way how it might go wrong, what the other curves might be. But if a deep neural net can drive your car and, uh, you know, 100,000 miles, it has no accident, you start to trust it, and then all of a sudden you have a fatal crash. Uh, because you are lured into a sense of complacency. So it's just that these systems are bigger, they're more complex, they're more capable, and they're more opaque. So maybe it just highlights all of the old issues and brings them into new relief. Uh, another question. I see microphone right there. Uh, Michael Clark, Office of Naval Research. Uh, two questions. One, as it relates to tr appropriate trust and reliance, does the desire for that and hopefully the desire for it to be honest and informative, shape what kind of methods are appropriate. So, for example, in a self-driving car that's based on a deep network, providing an explanation for its decision making to a human operator user that was objectively true would not be very informative, not even to, to the most expert out there, because the math isn't that complicated, it's about the training history. Second, most of the conversation so far has been about trust and reliance with respect to humans uh, assessment of the machine. But if we're really moving towards a teaming kind of model, have you thought at all about when you want the machine, if at all, to usurp the human in terms of the uh, authority to act? I think of cases like the German air wings, where you have an autopilot set to crash that knew it was going to crash, but was never designed or intended to cede authority from a human operator. And we have lots of cases like that. It's hard to imagine wanting it, the system to cede authority when it can't assess whether it's still within its own acceptable performance envelope or not. But if we move away from 
sheer mistakes and we move to bad actors in the human sphere, which there always will be, you know, Ron Arkin and others have made that argument on the, the morality side, do we want to think about when is it appropriate for machines to act uh, to block human actions when we perceive them to be uh, malevolent, which is not the same case as humans being too stupid to compete with these super intelligent beings that we're somehow going to magically create. Yeah, so I, th I think there are already cases where you want um, machines to make decisions instead of humans. The example earlier of the aborted takeoff was a good example. There are just limits of whether it's reaction time or perception um, that humans can do better than robots, and we've reliably demonstrated that this is true. Um, I think that as we approach a scenario where you have humans and machines teaming more or less as equals or with, with defined roles, we figured out what humans are good at, um, what machines are good at, um, that that will have to be investigated, absolutely, on a case-by-case -case basis. You'll get things where it's, it's no longer reaction time, but it's some other cognitive element that um, we've, we've demonstrated that a, a machine is more reliable. So it's absolutely true. I think psychologically and socially, we would also have a little bit of pushback to, to jump over that hump. I think people ha like innately feel uncomfortable interacting with a system that they can't stop it and say, no, don't do that. Um, regardless of whether they're right or wrong. We like to have control. Um, so I think we would definitely have to figure out how to frame such a, such a movement forward um, where we are trusting the system um, to be making the correct choice and the safe choice. Um, we, it would definitely be a trust issue, um, whether we know it or not. Um, the, the general public, um, we always assume rational operators, but we don't have a system of rational operators. So we have to kind of jump over that hump, and I think that'll be quite challenging. I've already seen something like that where the, when the Army's been transitioning from the co current command and control apparatus for Patriot to integrated, um, integrated battle command uh, under the IAMD concept. IAMD is a far more highly automated system and it's, they're going to have to come to grips with how to use that system, which they haven't really done. They work the technical side of it. The test operators who generally come from the Patriot community tend to look at that system through the lens of Patriot. And one of the comments they make is, we would like it to work more like Patriot. One of the things that bugs them is that when they allow the system to engage a track, the system doesn't, do it, doesn't necessarily do it right away. It will schedule it, and it tells them that it schedules it for engagement, which means using the logic, my internal logic, me speaking of, the, of, that, of that system, I will schedule that, for, that track for engagement at the appropriate time if I still think it needs to be engaged. And that absolutely drives these old-style Patriot test operators up the wall. They hate it, and they constantly complain about it. <laughs> when I push that button, I want it to shoot that track. Not schedule it, I want it to shoot it. It's that issue of being in control. Now, what, what will happen with this system when it goes, will it, will it be fielded with that capability? I don't know. It all depends on whether those troops accept it. Uh, the Army, uh, the, in the Army and the Command and General Staff Colleges run surveys with students in there, and I just read the most recent one coming out of the Mission Command Battle Lab about the acceptance of some of these technologies by younger officers who are more amenable to using technology, more so than the older officers. Uh, a great deal of skepticism about allowing themselves to be overridden by technology or by machines countermanding what they might decide to do. So yes, you will probably get some real pushback in doing that. Cultural, yes. Maybe rational, maybe not rational. I don't know. Hard to say. Yes, uh, over here we have a couple. Hi, I'm, I'm Ali Wan with the RAND Corporation. I wanted to follow up on a point or kind of a conjecture that Dr. Clune made. And so we've heard a lot, we've heard a lot today about the many ways in which artificial intelligence either is rivaling human capacity or in some cases exceeding human capacity. And I think that one of the reasons that human beings are inherently skeptical of at least certain aspects of artificial intelligence is a sense that we are ceding authority to a force that we can't completely understand. And so it raises the question, if we reach, hypothetically, we cross a threshold where artificial intelligence eclipses human beings, uh, encroaches on uh, areas of creativity that are normally the preserve of human beings, what makes, what gives human beings their unique identity? What are the core characteristics of being a human being if we reach a threshold at which artificial intelligence supplants us in one category after another? 
I think that the um, history of humanity is a lesson in humility, right? We used to think that uh, the world was created for us, around us, that we were the center of the universe. And uh, it's been a series of e body blows to our ego over time, right? And the, uh, the terrain that we have strided over with confidence and reigned over is shrinking. Uh, in terms of AI. If you look at the history of AI, there used to be, you know, this long list of things that AI can't do that we can do, and it's just kind of slowly shrinking, right? So the same exact system that I proposed earlier today, where I have a computer artist that's trying to make images that appease a deep neural network, which you could think of as a judge or a critic, that same system actually also produced a lot of beautiful images that looked like art to us. And most people consider art one of the last vestiges that's safe for AI to have dominance over AI. So for humans to have dominance over AI. So just on a lark, my students and I decided to submit those artworks to a competitive art competition held at my university where student artists spend the entire year developing their artistic portfolio, submit it, and only a very few of them, something like 35% of them, are accepted and hung on the wall of the museum. Not only was our computer AI generated art accepted, but it was also one of the pieces that was given an award. So there were people having wine and cheese sitting there trying to interpret the intention of the artist, not knowing, and the judges who accepted the piece of work also didn't know that it was completely AI generated. There was no intent at least not in the conventional sense. So um, it's a fabulous question, and we're just going to slowly have to continuously wrestle with the fact that we're not special, in my opinion, as AI gets more and more powerful. Got another question over here. Uh, thank you all. This has been a really fascinating discussion. I'd be curious to hear whether uh, you're starting to see or expect to see distinct differences in terms of how different cultures or nations are approaching these human factors issues. And uh, secondly, I'd uh, be curious as well if discuss some of the challenges of adopting uh, current organizational constructs and concepts to AI. To what extent do you think it's necessary to start from scratch in a sense and start thinking about designing entirely new uh, concepts and or organizational structures around AI, and can you imagine what that might look like going forward? Thank you. I can take the first part. Um, so I did a lot of research over in Asia, um, and I found that Asians tend to be really excited about the possibilities of autonomous systems and AI. Um, and when you talk to them about how humans will interact with that or about trust, um, particularly in maybe slightly more developing nations, um, they are very anxious to be the front runners. So they don't have nearly as much um, caution to the wind, I think, that the developed nations have about this type of stuff. Whether that's good or bad, I don't really have an opinion on that. Um, but they definitely are more accepting of new technologies, new ideas. Um, they're really anxious to put themselves on the map. So. Um, we talked a lot about China before, um, and the Chinese are a lot more excited about doing this kind of stuff um, from a public perspective, not from a research perspective, um, from a public perspective. And I think culturally that's something very different. So they definitely don't have the risk averse problems that we do in, in certain sectors of society. Um, I think if you were to take kind of a, a cultural snapshot of a lot of these countries in Asia, they would be a lot more similar to Silicon Valley than they would be to our um, like government structure. They're, they're definitely a lot more, uh, a lot more excited to, to get into it. Um, and they're, they're willing to tackle a lot of these human factors issues um, a lot more openly, I think. Um, at least that's been the experience that I've had um, working over in Asia. Does anybody want to take the other half of that question? I think the answer to that is yes, but don't ask me what they'll look like. Paul uh, Charest asked me one time in a an email conversation about some of those kinds of things or about the ways of relating to this type of automation technology in the sphere that I work. And I told him he ought to go talk to the Israelis because they appear to be doing a better job of that than we do. I can't really explain why that is. I think it has to do with more dynamic and better cooperation between their R&D side of the house and, and the military side of the house. They're not so separate. But he said it's difficult to get a handle on what they do because they won't talk about it. And I'd have to say that I found the same thing. I can generally get an idea of how, for example, Iron Dome works, but specifically how they structure their organizations or their command and control concepts for that, I really can't say. I can make some guesses about it based on my, my own experience, but I have no direct evidence of that because they tend not to want to talk about it. We've got if, time for uh, one more rapid fire question, unless you can have. Can I just take one step at the second half of that question? If I understood your question correctly, it was what might like higher like organizational structures look like amongst interacting AI agents? 
And if that's the question, I think it's a fascinating one to consider because the types of cognition in AI will be very, very different from those in humans. So for example, uh, right now AI is actually almost every AI that you encounter and you read about is a one-trick pony. It can only solve one task. And if it learns something really well, like how to play Go, it cannot then, it can go learn another task, but then it's forgotten how to play Go. But if we can solve that problem, which is called the problem of catastrophic forgetting, and get AI that can learn many, many different tasks like we do and then periodically go back and refine them, then you have to start wondering whether or not you need the sorts of hierarchical organization that you see in human civilization. For example, we have to have specialists that focus on you know, internal medicine or military organizational structure or, you know, aeronautics and whatnot. But might an AI that can kind of keep all of that in mind be able to just be able to study all of those things simultaneously? And therefore, would you need hierarchies? Would you need division of labor and specialization? I think it's a fascinating question that few people are talking about. One more question. Yeah, I just want to uh, bring up a, a kind of interesting uh, uh, project that my daughter is working on. She's a high school uh, STEM student. And so the, the research she's been working on during the summer internship was uh, uh, kind of studied the uh, brain, computer, brain machine interface. And uh, uh, essentially the, the initial intention is trying to uh, embed, uh, implant some, something into human brain so that uh, uh, patient can interact with uh, you know, artificial limbs or whatever. And then uh, along that whole discussion, her, her uh, professor actually uh, talked about the possibility of integrated AI with human brain. So all the discussion we had so far is more about treating AI as a separate machine, separate entity. But I think in the near future, like, very likely, there's going to be AI-enhanced human being. And so the brain can interact with our AI directly and you know that, that, that whole, it actually enhance the, the brain power of human being. And once you're at that level, I think that whole teaming concept, or maybe, you know, um, I don't know how to describe this, but I think it's going to open a very different scenario on how we leverage this capability to enhance human beings' life and, and, and maybe additional risk. Uh, I don't know, I mean, you're all researchers. I don't know if there's any research you guys are doing on this or any, any concept you want to share with us. Uh, you know, just general question. Any thoughts? And I think that's pretty much all the time we'll have. I just agree that that's a promising area. There's going to be a lot of work and a lot of uh, exciting developments on that front. Okay. Thank you, everyone.